Thanks for having me on the phone with uh, Stephen A. Uh, we did do a live last week in uh, the uh, town. So if you have any questions, go to the chat if you're watching uh, live. If you are watching recorded, send me down in the description down below, and I have time stamps about all of the questions that have been asked. So you can read through the questions and uh, see what you've done and uh, hopefully not see anything about the future. We're all still around and looking for that. Uh, but hope you like that. Uh, on most normal lives, I try and do the the actual uh, events that are live in the first 15 to 30 minutes of the live. And then after that, it's more depending on what we've got going on. So if you uh, like that content, I try and get all the information I can. Uh, Stephen A., um, it's the whole thing. So go down below and read it. Um, if you are wanting to watch this live, it is every Tuesday. It is every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central Time. So you can watch Stephen A. there. And if you want to watch the recording, you can watch the video later if you like. So enough with the, the chatter. Um, Your mic is quiet. My mic is quiet. So I'm going to make sure everything in my ears is going. I'm green. Sorry, guys. I was looking at Testing. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Wow, my mic is quiet. Why is my mic that quiet? Testing, testing. Uh, my mic isn't even on. Why is my mic not on? Oh, well, that's weird. I tested this just a little bit ago. Oh, that's why. Test the other one, too. There, that's probably better. Oh, my, that's too loud, sorry. There, that's a little bit better. <laughs> hey, everyone, welcome to my channel again. Um, welcome to Live by Right. Live things, you never know what's going to happen. So, um, why don't you throw me a question and we can get this thing started. Since I had a whole spiel of, what, a minute and a half at the beginning. Sorry. No sound? Taking a drink. <laughs> um, okay, now that we got that resolved, Walnut Woodworker. Um, I messed up a collectible saw trying to hammer out a kink more than I should. Replacing the plate while keeping everything else decreased the value. Yeah, hammering out kinks, um, that is, it's one of those things that takes a lot of skill and practice to do right. And uh, yeah, it doesn't always come out right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, if it's collectible, it, it, replacing the plate is, is going to, it, it's not going to have any collectible value anymore. Um, that, that'll, that'll destroy collectability. As in the functionality of it, that won't make much of any a difference. Uh, so if it's a user, the user price will remain the same. I think you mentioned that the saw was from the 1950s. Uh, in that case, the collectible value on is, is, is very, very minimal. Um, and so I, I would not worry about that at all. If you want to keep the saw and keep it going, then yeah, go ahead and replace the, the plate, recut the teeth, and uh, you're good to go. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll lose any collectible value from it. So there won't be much from that, uh, that age of a saw. What's next? I'm getting mixed about sound is good and sound isn't good. It's not resolved. Turn up. Let me check one more time. Is that... Uh, welcome to uh, coming back from the shop. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Yeah, it is a bit on the quiet side still. Hey y'all, I'm J oh, there we go. I always use that as my uh, sound check. So that should be a little bit better. What's next? Let's see. Clark asks, I have two sets of leg frames that have four posts each. So four legs in two separate frames. They're designed to go into the tabletop via sliding dovetail, then be pinned. This is to be used for an embroidery table. Will the racking forces cause my dovetails to split the tabletop down the lignin? Lignin, yeah. The top is three inches thick, and the dovetails are one and an eighth inches tall. Um... It has more to do with how wide the base of the dovetail is. Uh, but in that case, if you, basically you have two legs, one on either end, um, and so you have nothing that stops the racking except for the connection between the top of the leg. So I'm assuming that the top of the leg is like something that's like three inches wide with a dovetail running down the middle. Um, in that case, you're probably not going to have a problem with the dovetail breaking off. However, you're going to have a lot of racking on the table, and it's not going to be a very stable table. Um, the, you, you need a little bit more support on that. 
Um, if you have a really thin dovetail, then yeah, you may end up breaking the dovetail on there. Um, but the, the problem is just the stability of the table. Um, you, you need something that gives you a, a wider connection. Um, so the way that's normally fixed is the, the top plate of the leg structure, so all the pillars that connect into that top plate, that top plate then is much wider. So if you, that top plate is you know, six inches, eight inches wide, and with a dovetail in the middle of it, that six, eight inch wide gives you a lot more leverage of a connection to the tabletop. Uh, so that would fix a lot of the racking. Or you could put in cross brace, bracing or another uh, stretcher between the legs, uh, and that would uh, alleviate a lot of it. Um, but yeah, um, if you have specifics on it, you can send me uh, pictures or drawings and I can answer that. What's next? Oh, a couple people are still saying they can't hear, but a lot are saying they can't. I don't know. I turned you up a smidge more. We'll see. Oh, excuse me. Um, Wharton Munt. <clears throat> oh, jeez. <laughs> it's a silly question. <laughs> Those are the best. <laughs> what polish do you use on your head to keep it so shiny? Oh, my, my, uh, uh, my, my, well, here, let me grab it down. Oh, I don't have it down. Where'd it go? You don't have it right My shop there. made home paste wax, of course. What else would I use? <laughs> I thought you were going to say boiled linseed oil. Well, that, that's, that's like a once a week coat, but then the paste wax gives it the glossy appearance on top. You need more Valium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know if you meant Valium. Um... <laughs> But Valium is oh, a funny answer volume. for me. Um, we always need more Valium. That's always the correct answer. Um, anyways, there's a little... I can check it one more time just to make sure, but I think we're hitting the pegs on it. Hey, y'all. I'm James Wright. Yeah, it's right about where it should be. Oh. Okay, uh, what's next? Uh, let's see. Sumi asked... Do you know of resources for disabled woodworkers? Um, honestly, I haven't come across a lot um, because every disability has different limitations and different things that fit into it. Um, so I haven't really come across a, a good resource for general disability. It would be, it'd be an interesting one to do. Um, the common one is wheelchair, um, and that is, uh, it, it ends up being a modification of the bench to fit the, the wheelchair so that there is more that is just within reach at all times. Um, and it's kind of an interesting um, design because you'll see some of them where the bench is actually at the height of the armrest on the wheelchair, so it's really down there low. Um, it has the same idea of a, a tall bench. Then there's some where the wheelchair can roll underneath it, but that puts the, the, the work up here almost at armpit height, and so that kind of um, presents its own um, issues. Um, but yeah, I don't know of any particular solid resources on it. If anyone has, let me know. That'd be a, that'd be a good thing to collect and put together a, a resource of resources, something like that. <laughs> What's next? Um, let's see, Doctor Khan. Okay, he had like two questions. So hang on. Traditional hide glue, primarily with hide glue being reversible. Does that mean that what is left in the pot will remelt when heated, or just that it is easy to debond if necessary? That's uh, one question. Okay. Should Do you I answer, answer that? that and then move uh, on? Yes and yes. That means it's both. Um, the PVA is also reversible, but it is not reversible with heat, at least not any normal heat where it would damage the wood. Um, and so you can reverse PVA with water. Um, the nice thing about hive glue is you can reverse it with both water and heat and a combination of the two. Um, that being said, it is still really, really, really difficult to do that. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of precision in order to make it happen. So simple reversibility, making it sound like, yeah, it's really easy. You can take it apart and put it back together. No, it's actually a ton of work to make that actually um, come apart. Um, so it is not really easily reversible that way. Um, but as in the what's left over in the pot, yeah, well, when it's done and it dries out, um, you can re-add water to it and mix it up again. Um, if it's in its gelatin state, you can just heat it up again and, uh, and go to town on it. If you uh, dry it out all the way into uh, uh, a harder piece, you just add a little more water and heat it up again. And you can use it over and over and over again 
Um, it's just chains of, uh, of uh, protein, so really easy stuff. What's next? What's the other half? Um, sorry, just switching gears from work to this. Uh, so Dr. Khan had a second question that said, also, I forget if your previous video mentioned the open times and shelf lives of the deferring grades of purchased haiku flakes. Um, no, um, the open time and shelf times, shelf time of high glue is eternity. Um, high, high glue basically does not have a, a, a shelf life. It, when it's dry, it will last for forever. Um, in all honesty, it, it doesn't it doesn't rot, it doesn't subside. It, if you keep it dry, it's good. Um, open times depends completely on how much water you put into it, how hot you get, do you add extra things, do you add some urea to it. Uh, there are lots of things that you can wildly change um, high glue's open time. Um, it has very little to do with the brand of high glue or how it was made. Um, it has all to do with how you actually prepare it, which will determine its open time. Um, so, hope that answers the question. What's next? Sorry, the shop's freezing. <laughs> yeah, the, we, hit, we were gone, so the house was at uh, what, 45 degrees. Well, the basement still hasn't warmed up, and the concrete is just, uh, it's taking a lot to get the, the heat back into it. <laughs> just kind of fuzzy um, big heat. Okay. So our shop right now is currently like 55, 56. And Sarah's missing her hoodie. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Richard Smith, do you happen to know if pole saws were ever used by Western woodworkers back in the day? I doubt over the course of the centuries nobody in Europe had the idea. Oh, yeah. They've, they've, they've come in and out of fashion, um, especially in the European um, uh, frame saws, bow saws. Um, there, there, was a, um, there was a lot of use of using the frame saw on push or on pole stroke. Um, but as into like the Japanese style um, with the handle, it's always really good to drop your saws on the floor. It helps them and keeps them in alignment. Uh, <laughs> but as like with the, with the Japanese style, um, there I don't know of any examples of one of these happening. The, the problem with with introducing this into the Western society is that all the woodworkers were trained with a Western handle. Um, either like this or you might get into um, like this. And the, the, there's a certain body mechanic that goes with pushing the saw. And if someone did try a pull saw, um, it would not work as well because they had trained themselves for the push stroke. And once you have that in your body, it takes a lot to switch over to this. Um, they're, they're two very different body mechanics. Um, and if you've been trained on this and you've gotten good on this, then jumping into this is going to be learning it all over again. Um, so it's a, it's a very different ball of wax. Um, but if you go back and look at it, um, 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 Egyptian woodworkers, you know, 4,000 years ago plus, um, they were using saws very similar to this uh, with, a, with a pole tooth and a straight handle off the back. Because right? if you really think about it, the simplest and most basic design is a plate with teeth. And how do you hold that plate with teeth? Well, you, you stick a handle on the end of the plate, and there you go. Um, you start getting into things that are more complicated with a back, and this designed to get into the, the push capability. Um, but you will see these in all sorts of different cultures throughout the, throughout the world. Um, but it's usually one or the other because of the body mechanic and the learning of it. Um, it's kind of part of the society. No, oh, someone super chatted. Hey, thanks. It hasn't even come to, There we go. I was like, it hasn't even come to <laughs> What we got? Warren, thank you. Thank you, Warren. Oh. Why don't you give me a I'll question? I'll give you a question while I get my mom jokes out. Um. Sorry, we're still on island time. <laughs> <laughs> getting off, getting back home is just like hitting a brick wall when you have to get back to work and get thing, get into life again. <laughs> um. Zag Studios asks, I watched your video on your wood shoes and I know you added purple heart to the bottom of it, but are you still considering doing a video on making new wood shoes? Um, it is one of those things I would like to do because I didn't actually carve these. I started with blanks, um, but it's one of those things that um, I have to do it. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's on my list for someday, but I have no idea when and probably not anytime soon um, because I still use these things 
every day. Um, but I guess I should probably make a backup pair. Um, yeah. Though what I would love to do is actually I, I have a Cooper's knife, and I'd actually like to make a Cooper's bench and actually do them up properly, um, correctly. Um, but that'd be them. Uh, I would also have to find a freshly cut poplar um, or something of that nature to have the, the, the body. So I might do it out of something different. Um, poplar is just what, what these ones are made out of, except for the sole now. What's next? Or did you get a... Um. I can smell the smoke. I'm struggling tonight. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> She had her first full day of work at the hospital, and uh, <laughs> okay, it's, I got one. I yeah, got one. it's been solid. <laughs> All right. If April showers bring May flowers, what do May flowers bring? Pilgrims. <gasps> <laughs> I wasn't sure if you'd be quick enough tonight to get to that one. No, that, that was that was one that our, our family used to tell. So oh. that one's been ingrained in me. Oh, miss the comment part. That's coffee for Sarah, but need to. Get... <laughs> But need what? Warren, don't you know I don't usually drink coffee? Hot chocolate. Need ultimately. to come to oh, Australia, Australia for everyone. Yeah. We were actually looking at uh, um, a trip to Australia next year. Don't think it'll happen, but it uh, would be fun. Yeah, island, island, Caribbean islands, guys. That's where we were. <laughs> or Caribbean. Which way, which way you want to say it. Um, sorry. What's the next question? I'm trying to catch up on questions on that. Okay, here, let oh, me sorry. ask you this one. I'll go back over there. So Clockman45, um, okay, background. You know a guy who makes hold fast. Clockman's question is, can he make a cutter for a four-inch router? Um, a four-inch router? Are you talking about like a, a mini router with a with a four inch base, um, or are you talking about a four inch wide cutter and router? Uh, but uh, yeah, he could make either. Um, the well, the guy who makes the holdfast that I use um, is uh, Black Bear Forge, um, but pretty much any blacksmith out there can make one of these. They're actually really simple to make. Uh, it's one of the the things you kind of learn when you become a blacksmith. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm sure he could. Um, he's just, he is, <laughs> he is, um, he's on back order. Let's just say when you when you order something from him, it's going to be a while until you get it because he's in high demand. Uh, but as to making a base, I mean, really all it is is a flat surface with a hole and a set screw in it. Um, so you could make that out of a piece of angle bracket. Um, it really isn't that much to it. Um, yeah, I guess you would have to specify exactly what you're thinking. But feel free to send me an email. I'm sorry I probably messed that question up. <laughs> What's next? Um, sorry. You... One night, you're going to sit here and I'm going to be uh, there. Is, is your microphone pointing up? What's wrong with my microphone? Oh, I thought you were looking at the volume. Sorry. No, I was looking at you. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yelling at you. No, that's normal. <laughs> I deserve it most of the time. I was going to say. <laughs> uh, Livewires7316 says, Love your videos. One question, not wood related. Why on earth are you wearing a Rough Rider jersey? <laughs> um, let's see. It would have been two years ago. In uh, January of 2020, I went to... Um, um, Saskatoon um, to see, uh, um, oh, come on, Hand Tool Rescue. And the two of us restored uh, the barn's metal lathes, and uh, we restored them side by side and did a collaboration. Uh, while I was there, uh, friends gave me this, and uh, I don't know why I put it on today, but I put it on today, and uh, that's what I'm wearing now. <laughs> it's a nice shirt. I like it. But, yeah, it's like um, the Rough Riders, the Packers and the, the uh, um, oh, come on, South Africa. Um, uh, spring books? Spring books. They're all the same color genre and uh, just all kind of fit together to me. So 
We have a, Sarah has a Springboks jersey. Uh, we have what? What? I, if you what? think they all look the same, well, yeah. If you <laughs> look at one, the, the first thing that pops in my brain, and any of them is Packers, and then I'm like, oh no, that's that specific. But good eye. <laughs> it's not your typical. You usually have some. Yeah, I don't have any of my dad joke shirts on tonight. Dad joke or. <sighs> What's next? Nothing. I'm just going to be an ice cube. Oh, let's see. Casey. Hey, James. I was looking for a budget friendly jaw knife for bow making. Where do you know where I can get one? You know, with, with a draw knife, um, I mean, you can pick up antique ones for 25, 30 bucks. Um, pull it down. If, uh, if you have a place to get them. Um, I know Menards um, actually sells a draw knife that is really cheap and junky and the handles aren't quite right, but it works. And honestly, with a draw knife, there's not much to it. It's a sharpened edge with handles on either end. And sometimes the handles are like this and sometimes they're out straight. Uh, sometimes they're knobs. They come in all different shapes and sizes. They come in different angles, bevel up, bevel down, bevel turned. Um, and every one of those ends up being a personal preference or hey, this one's a little better for that use and this one's a little better for that use. Um, there isn't any one that makes anything better than the other other than the durability of the steel. And most of the time, these are actually a little bit softer of a steel than other, um, like your, your chisels and things. Uh, it makes them a little bit faster and easier to sharpen. Um, so there really isn't too much to getting a good one. Um, most of the options come down to personal choice. Now you will have a lot of people like, no, no, this is the good one and this is not a good one, but the, in reality, there's not much to this. So um, yeah, don't overthink it. If it's uncomfortable, then get a different one. But as to budget options, um, antiques are usually the way to go, um, but the price on them has been going up a little bit as well with anything with hand tools because so many people have been getting into it recently. As to new, there aren't a whole lot of options, though. Um, I, I just mentioned the one from uh, Menards because I saw it today, and I thought, mm, I should get that one and try it out. No, that's because you're at Menards and went, I need to buy something. I'm here. <laughs> because I don't know what you're talking about. you should buy stock at Menards for as often as you're there. Anyway. What's next? Let me look at it. Carol Cakes. So, saw the largest... Fish on your trip. I'm guessing what is the largest fish um, on your trip? We didn't see much because we, we didn't go diving. We just got, went snorkeling. Uh, I saw a, a barracuda that was about two foot long. It was a kind of smaller barracuda. But it was probably the largest fish I saw. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't go diving, so I didn't get to see a lot. We were mostly at uh, sandy beaches with a light reef, so there wasn't a whole lot to see. But we did have fun. It was the first time that we got to take all the kids out um, snorkeling. So, what's next? Oh, uh, let's see. We got some newer faces on tonight. This excites me. Welcome, Arthur England. I mean, at least new to asking questions. They might have been watching the whole time. Um, I'm inspired by your focus on hand tools. Did you find a place in your shop and workflow for? any power tools um well if i didn't have a youtube channel i would have a very solidly hybrid shop with a table saw a thickness planer um, a band saw um, there would be several other things in here however on this channel i teach hand tool woodworking so if i pull out a power tool i'm no longer teaching the hand tool woodworking and so it's, it's kind of counterproductive for the channel um, so in my shop I really don't have any power tools that I use regularly. I have a few that I that I pull out from time to time. I have a you know a, a Dewalt drill. Um, I have a grinder. Um, I have a, you know, a vacuum. Um, I think what else I have in here that's power tool ish. Um, now out in my garage, I have a table saw. I have a jointer. I have a, a thickness planer, um, but they are um, seriously packed away, so they're hard to get to, um, and I don't don't use them much. Um, Pretty much the only time I would pull them out is if I have a lot of material I have to do and I have a video I have to get out and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, the um, pre-production work of getting stuff ready. Um, but for the actual use of the projects, I 
I don't use it because I, I'm, I'm teaching. Uh, but if I didn't have the YouTube channel, then I would, I would be a lot more hybrid. What's next? Let's see. Where, Warren Munn, where can we get the t-shirts, James? Where's... <laughs> Talk to my family. Um, although the recent ones, I bought a couple for the cruise that I just got on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon are those t-shirt things you see on Facebook. <laughs> Every now and then Sarah sends me one. like, you want this? <laughs> <laughs> we buy funny shirts. Life's too short. So am I. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, invasion. Go. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Andy Puttbach. That sounds like a fun name. Anyways, what is the best way to sharpen draw knives and scorps? Um, I actually have a video on that. Um, I do most of mine. I'll take the, the plate. Oops. Well, there's that saw that was on the floor. Get that up in a little bit. I'll take my plate and pop it out of the sharpening station, and I will take it to it. So I'll hold this kind of like a violin, and drop another saw on the floor, and I'll sharpen like that. Um, I find that to work really well. The problem with a scorp is you can do that for the outside of the, the, the convex surface, but for the inside, um, you can't use a, a flat plate. Um, and so what most people do is they either have a slipstone that has um, a, a rounded surface to do that, um, or they have a stone that has been rounded over the years um, and basically turned into a big slipstone. Um, or one of the more common, um, simpler ways now is um, with, dowel on, with dowel on a sandpaper. Sandpaper on a dowel um, can get you on the inside there. Um, you know, a scorp, unless you use it, quite regularly it's not something that gets dull very fast and it's not something you have to sharpen all the time um, whereas with a draw knife you use that a good bit more so that's something that you, you do sharpen quite a bit so I hope that answers the question but if you want to see it I have a whole video on sharpening this actually I think I used sharpen that one I've got a few of them in the shop <laughs> oh. what's next let's see dust and light what was the first hand tool project you were proud of? Um, my first, uh, well, my first hand tool furniture was my bench, uh, my, my first bench. Um, and yeah, proud of that one. Uh, the first piece of furniture that didn't go in the shop was a coffee table. Um, yeah, I'm, there's not much that I'm not proud of. Um, I, I, yeah, I like most everything I build. <laughs> I, I, I don't stress out over things about not being great. Um, if I made it, I like it. That's uh, kind of the way I do it. So every hand tool thing I've made. <laughs> I mean, you have to remember your first hand tool project came after years of power tool projects yeah. too. So. No, it's one of the things I've, I, I was... I was woodworking for 25 years before I uh, got into uh, to hand tools, so uh, it's a little different. <laughs> Let's see. Luis Fernando Carrion Gonzalez. Advice, please. A tenon saw I am refurbishing is sticking in the cut halfway through the stroke. I tried adding more set and a little oil, but it still sticks. Okay. Uh, one of two common problems. Um, oil isn't going to last very long on a saw face. Um, it just rubs off quickly. Um, so usually I like to use wax. I use uh, my hard wax, which is uh, beeswax and oil mixed together. Um, and that being on the side of it will lubricate a good bit more. Uh, but if it's sticking, that usually means that something is twisting in the cut and no amount of wax is going to fix that. Um, now it could be that your body mechanic is causing the saw to warp and twist or turn, and that will cause it to jam up. Um, that's really common, especially when you're beginning. Let me turn this off before I'm forgetting. Um, so if you're putting anything into it, but if you're finding that it's just that one saw that's causing the problem, um, then it could be that you have too much set on one side or the other, and it's actually starting to turn in the cut, 
and it's turning a little bit too fast and actually pinching up on it. Um, and so what you're going to want to do is actually st what they call stoning the saw. Dude, it's totally stoned. Um, yeah, I've got a video on that as well. Um, so look up how to stone a saw and uh, you'll see that. What happens is that there's too much set on one side and not enough set on the other. Um, and that will cause it to be aggressive on one side and start to turn over. And so the side that's aggressive, you want to clean off the set. And so you actually take a sharpening stone and you stone that side to grind down the teeth on that side a bit. Um, that's fairly common. Um, the next one is that the board is actually pinching it. The board is, um, is, is bending down or has stress in it that's binding on it. Um, that may be the issue. So I think that'd be the most of them. Hey, another super chat. Sumi, thank you. Did you see what Sumi said? That's not how you hold a violin. I know, I know. It's <laughs> not how you. Fine. <laughs> this is my favorite violin that I like to give my children. Yes. <laughs> Tiny violins. Oh, let's see. Thanks, Sumi. Oh, I have to find another. Do you, you have a joke a, off the top of your give head? Give me a question and I'll... Let's see. Richard Smith. Let's pretend we're making an arts and crafts style desk. How much longer slash percent would it take you to make it using hand tools only versus machine tools? Um, it, it depends completely on the project. Every... Every project is different in how you put it together in the joinery. Um, like if I were using a domino, I could put it together really quickly. Um, but if I'm actually wanting solid mortise and tenon joinery, um, it's going to take a little longer um, in either mount. Um, power tools, their big benefit is when you're doing multiple of the same thing, you can run all the boards through in the one step. With hand tools, it takes twice as long to cut two as it does one. It takes four times as long to cut four as it does one. There, there is no time savings on multiples. Whereas when you're working with power tools, the time is in setting up the tool. And then you can run them all through. And so you have a time savings of doing multiples on, on power tools. So if you have a piece that is made up of um, a bunch of the same items or has multiple slats in it, like you see a lot on um, mission furniture, you have you know, similar styles, uh, st uh, styles and rails throughout the, the, the furniture piece. Power tools make that very, very fast, and you can be very efficient with it, in which case then it would be much, much faster. Um, on average, if I had a full power tool shop, and a full hand tool shop, um, the average furniture piece for me, it's about um, four to five times longer to make it with hand tools over power tools on an average piece. Some pieces it may be closer to you know one to one. Some it might be closer to you know ten to one. Um, but it really it depends on the piece and how many multiple items that are the same. Um, if you have a lot of tenons that are all the same, then they cut very easily in power tools. So yeah. Oh, we have another super chat. Another one. Thank you, Richard. All right. You got a mom joke? I got one for Sue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What was the first thing did what was the first thing the CEO of IKEA did when elected president of Sweden? What? Assembled his cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Do they have presidents in Sweden? I don't know. Um, what did Richard say? Richard said, dude, you are awesome. Thanks for helping become a woodworker. You're welcome, That's Richard. how Richard said it. That's how I read it. <laughs> 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 We're dorks. It's okay. Um, if you want it serious, go see somebody else. Anyways, uh, Ken Carlisle. Question for James. Can you offer some advice on setting up a side rabbit plane Parentheses, number 79. Um, you know, uh, where did mine go? Where did mine go? Oh, it's down here. So a side rabbit plane is a really interesting plane. And I've got a couple on these. Um, and it's for cutting, it's for working on the sidewall of a rabbit um, or a groove. Um, and so the blade actually comes out the side here. 
and it's a much lower angle. And so this will allow you to then do the, the, the side of a groove or a rabbit. Um, and they are kind of finicky to adjust. Because they are such a low angle, you actually have to move the blade in and out quite a bit. And you want the tip to come down just to the bottom of this. You don't want it to stick out much lower than the bottom of your skate. But you need the blade sticking out past the skate by the thickness of the shaving you want. Um, and so they are kind of finicky. Uh, most of the time, the, the tip ends up being ground off and it actually ends up being a little longer than this. Um, so you, you end up uh, smoothing off the, the tip and so they're not, they don't come to a perfectly sharp point right at the tip. Um, and that way you can adjust the depth of cut, in other words, how far does this blade stick out that way. Um, so a lot of times I actually like to take the, the foot off to adjust this, um, to have it taking the right amount, and then I'll put the foot back on. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that, it's fiddly. Um, and once it's set up, you don't touch it. Um, because you gotta do, you got to use it quite a bit before you have to resharpen it again. Um, I think I've only sharpened mine once since I've had it. Um, so it's not one of those things that you have to use all the time. So, yeah. Um, but go take a look at the video on that. I have a video on, I think I have two on there. Although they're pretty old, so I might have to do a new one. That might make a good idea. Is that another one? Oh, yes. the Walnut Woodworker. Thank you, man. What do we got? Okay, Walnut Woodworker said, The saw I messed up was a 14 and a quarter inch 1850s distant. Oh, that's right. That was a weird one. Where are you seeing pictures of that? Yeah, um, you replacing the plate on that would, would um, you, you wouldn't have any collector's value in it anymore. Um, just leave it the way it's, it is if you want the collector's value, but, but because you were already doing some hammering on it to try and take the kink out, you, you probably already um, lost that value on it. So um, up to you and what you want to do with it. But uh, yeah, thanks, man. Do you know what the bald man said after getting a great deal on a wig today? What? It was a small price to pay. <laughs> Should I get a toupee? <laughs> I, yes, and I wanted you to wear it for a live, and I want to see if anyone notices. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard. That was yours. <laughs> oh. What? Nothing. They're just their comments. They, I just, I'm on a roll today. What can I say? I'm trying to also find questions in between all the comments. Oh, la, la, la. Here, I'm going to give you a question and then I'm going to pull things out. Sounds good. All right. Zared Shaver? Shaver? I'm not sure. I remember you or someone else say that the screws for a lot of Stanley adjusters are oddball. Do you know if that's true for a router plane adjuster screw? I need a replacement for a bent one. Um, I don't know. I've never measured mine. Um, I would probably say the most of the thumb screws are pretty standard, if I remember correctly. But I've never checked it, so I don't know for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I have to. Actually, let me see. Do I have a way of checking mine here? I don't. My set's up in the garage. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it looks like a quarter twenty, but uh, it could be something wildly different. So, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I have a quarter twenty here to stick into it. But yeah, Stanley also often did quarter twenty-two which used to be a common size 100 years ago, um, but then they moved to fine thread and coarse thread, which was quarter 20 and quarter 24, so the quarter 22 doesn't exist anymore. Then they used a couple other weird ones for other places. But uh, if I remember correctly, the thumb screws were, were more standard, but uh, I, I don't remember, so sorry. <laughs> What's next? Did I ask this one? Before? Oh, he was saying they are weird. Let me go grab a quarter twenty and stick it in there and see. It may oh, be one of those I thought they 20. were talking about the two of us. What? They are weird. I was going to say, yep. Here. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. 
10, 20, quarter 20. There we are. Yeah, that's not it. No, shoot. Stop. Yeah, it's a lot smaller. Not by much. It's not a quarter 24. So it probably is the, the quarter 22, which is annoying. Yeah. It is a weird ball. <laughs> All right. What's next? We, I still owe a mom joke to a walnut woodworker. Ah, what's he got? What sound does a cow make when it runs out of milk? What? Utter silence. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fall asleep, Ken. Shh. <laughs> Not yet. I feel like a fish. Sleep with my eyes. Um... All right. Next question. Let's see. Waterfall. Can you create dado yes. longer than the fence with a forty-five Stanley forty-five combination plane? Dado longer than the fence. Um. Yes. I'm probably missing something in the question, but yes. Most of the time, I end up cutting ones that are longer. So, I think I'm missing something. But yes, yes, you can. <laughs> Respond back with what you're asking exactly, and I might be able to help you out. Because um, if it's you know longer than the fence, yeah, because uh, I'll cut them as long as they need to be. What's next? Uh, let's see. What did Clark say? Do you find that with more joints, it becomes harder to fit the whole project together? More joints, it becomes harder. Well, yeah, especially if you have something that is that all has to come together at once. Um, usually, the the way you design something is to have sub assemblies. So you have legs that go into you know top plates, bottom plates, and that's one assembly. And you have a couple of those that go together individually, and then those go together onto a main base. And then there's there's sub assemblies that you put together to make it a little easier. But yes, if you have to put a lot of joints together at once, that can be a very stressful glue up. And that's the point I switch over to epoxy uh, because it's just it, it takes the stress out of it to do it with something that has a curing time of hours as opposed to um, 20, 30, 40 minutes. So yeah, lots of joints can can be stressful. <laughs> um, the second part to his question was, how many joints were in your most complex project? Um, I don't know, what is my most, probably your dresser. Because um, that was... My dresser, the dresser we share? Yes, I made it for you. Uh, 24 drawers. Um, so probably somewhere around four or five hundred joints all throughout it, depending well, upon what you classify as a joint. Um, yeah, something like that. It was rather complex, but every piece was individual, so it wasn't something you, you put a lot together. You did it in sub-assemblies. So. Hey, another super chat. Tyson, we haven't seen you in a while. Or I haven't Thanks, seen man. you in a while. What, what does it say? Waterfall means wider than the fence, like 12 inch from the edge. Also, please give us the evil spreadsheet like. <laughs> <laughs> um, why? Okay. Means wider than the fence, like 12 inches. Um, so let me get a board and, and talk through what I'm seeing. Set this down. Here's a project I'm coming up, making a few more hand clamps. Mm, set that down. Uh, so if I'm making a dado, let me grab my Stanley 50 since it's right here. Um, dados go across the grain. So like in this case, this board is what, about 14 inches across. 
So it, running a data this way, there, there, there's, I, I don't see why it would be a problem um, because you're, you're not judging off the width of the board, you're just judging off of the, the point at which it's touching the, um, the fence. Um, trying to see what's a, what I'm missing on this. Like from 12 inches from the edge. Oh, I think you're saying, can I make a dado into the board that is farther in than my beams can reach? So like in this case, my beam can only be about six inches away. So if I put that on the edge here, but what if I want it in, in here? Um, in that case, what you can actually do is clamp on a dummy fence. Um, so I can take a board. Here, let me set this up so you guys can see what I'm talking about here. And I've done this on a couple projects. Um, so what you can do is take another board and clamp it down here. Put a clamp here and a clamp here, and then use that for your fence to ride along the inside of this so that your plane can then ride on that. It wouldn't be something quite as massive as this. It's usually just like a, a quarter inch thick scrap of whatnot. So I would use something like, like this little thin thing. And I can clamp that down. And then I can put my fence riding along that to then make my, my dado on there. Um, yeah, so when I made my um, plane till, there's the word, <laughs> um, I have all of these um, dividers that are all in grooves running down the board. Uh, and so I used the fence on the previous groove to cut the next one. Um, and just continued them sequentially across, letting the fence ride on the, the last one. Um, so that works pretty commonly. It's, I think that's what you're talking about. So, sorry, I could be very wrong. Um, but if so, that's how I'd fix it. <laughs> What's next? Oh, she's looking up a monitor. I'm sorry. I... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> They're all taking bets on that, whether or not you're actually asleep or not. Shut up! <laughs> you're all so mean to me. That's what I do. Alan's I'm good at not it. even here. I'm feeling very, very picked on. Um, let's see. Justin Woods, would you ever make a box joint box with bent over fingers put on thin gauge steel? Box joint box with bent over fingers? That's what it says. On thin gauge steel, is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Put on thin gauge steel. I have no idea what you're asking. Sorry, I'm missing something. That's completely normal though. So feel free to add additions and put it back up there. But we're actually getting really close. So I don't know if we'll have time. What's next? Uh, let's see. Richard Smith, what should I get first? Router plane or shoulder plane? How and how good are the Stanley 92s that are floating around eBay and the price of, two, of tools on eBay is getting absurd, agree? Oh yeah, eBay's always been more expensive. Um, eBay is the, the more, most expensive place you can buy hand tools generally. Um, unless you get do a lot of hunting and something misspells or something's misplaced, um, eBay is usually the most expensive place. Um, Router plane, I use the router plane far more than I use the shoulder plane. The shoulder plane comes out once, twice a year, if that. Um, if, if I was a beginner and I was still having problems with getting things really up nice and tight, I might use it a little bit more because it's, it's great for that last little cleanup finesse up against the shoulder, um, but I don't use it that much. Um, yeah, so router plane because I use that quite regularly. Uh, router planes are a very, very common thing. Um, as to the used ones, they're great. Uh, the nice thing about a shoulder plane, there isn't much that can go wrong with it. There aren't many bad ones out there. Um, they all have their own, um, yeah. Uh, honestly, getting a, a cheap one on Amazon, uh, they work really well. Uh, there's, there's not much to them. Um, I, um, Tay Tools has also started making one that I like. Um, he has one that's actually a, a two-piece of a bullnose. Um, that's a really, really good little tool. So, yeah, router planes first. What's next? All right, I got a joke for Tyson. Okay, two wrongs don't make a right, but what do two rights make? 
Another right. An airplane. Well, that too. <laughs> At least we made another right. We made three more of them. <laughs> no, we made crazies. Anyway. <laughs> I, okay, I think we're caught up on uh, questions, so just hang on a second. Guess what happens when a guy woodworker is asked to help in the kitchen to cut up potatoes? The potato pieces all end up us for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> um, okay, hang on. Y'all are typing so fast. I feel like I There's two more right down question. the bottom unless you want to... Okay, Morn Manis, could you buy other bars that are longer and screw them into the plane? Talking about that combination plane. Yeah, later. yeah, you can. Because um, the, the bars on them are just a simple steel rod. So as long as you get them with the right diameter, you can get them as long as you want to. Um, yeah, you could do that, no problem. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, okay, with the, the 45 and 55, they're just smooth rods that go all the way through, and so you can you can get any smooth rod that's the right diameter, slide it in there, and you're good to go. With the Stanley 50, they actually thread into the main body, um, and so you'd have to you'd have to thread the end, um, but you could do that and make as long as you need them to. I've just never done that because I usually just clamp a fence on it. Works pretty well, unless I had to make a really deep dado dado um, or groove. Okay, we have clarification for the bent fingers box thing. Okay. So Justin said, a metal box made with finger joints instead of welding, and the fingers get bent over so you can't pull it apart. I see. Um, I have never done that, though, yeah, should. Um, there's a lot of different metal folding methods to do corners without welding them. Um, but uh, yeah, I would guess it would. But I'm not I'm not as big into metalworking as I used to be. Although I used to supervise a metalworking shop. Uh, we didn't do a lot with sheet metal though. So sounds like a fun little project. We got time for a couple more? Yeah, I think so. Um, and Sue, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. I'm sorry. Um, asked, do you have a Stanley 46? And do you use it if you have it? Stanley 46. I don't remember what that is. Um, let me look this up. Stanley, Stanley numbers, I don't always know them all because I don't. Stanley 40 picks. Blah, blah, blah. Stanley 40 picks. Oh my. Stanley 46. Oh, oh yeah, the, the skewed. No, I do not have one. Um, it's a, a, a cool um, skewed um, combination plane, but no, I do not have one. That's been that's once on my list that someday I'll pick up, but I have not yet. Kind of a cool plane, but not as common because it's a a bit fiddly, unlike the forty-five or fifty-five. <laughs> What's next? Let's see. Ken Carlisle said, "Is there a reason to get the mortise chisel adapter for the Veritas?" Honing jig MK2. No, no, um, no. Um, yeah, I don't even use the narrow adapter for because I've never needed it. Um, the regular one does perfectly fine for narrow or thick or. Um, I guess the only thing is if you have a really fat mortising chisel, it might be too big for the screws. Uh, where's mine? So if if it's too thick. For the screws, it would have to be really darn thick. So let's see how far I can get this down. So I can get it almost open a full quarter inch, because um, that would be the only thing is um, is is this gap too small? In which case, then you need longer screws on here. Um, in which case, then that that would be useful. But most of mine here would fit on there without much issue at all. Oh, just have to open it up a little more. Let's open it, not tighten it. And I can slide that out and clamp it down. Um, so, yeah, no, I don't. Uh, if you have a big one, then yeah. But if not, I don't see a huge re need reason for it. 
but I like to go with less jigs than not. So what's next? Let's see. Um, what did Clark say? Have you seen Mr. Chickadee's channel, and have you considered interviewing him like you did with Matt, Ann, and Rob? Yes, um, I have reached out to him, and I have not been able to um, get in touch with him. But uh, yeah, if I can, I'd love to. Um, um, there's several other channels like that that I've been trying to reach out to that uh, haven't responded yet. But uh, okay, y'all. Eventually, you know what that means. <laughs> Y'all need to send the same message and say, hey, this is what we want. Um, <laughs> I just like to see Bob barred people's mailboxes. I think that'd be funny. Anyways, let's see. Uh oh, worth the effort. What do you say? Have you tried cutting brass yet with hand tools? Peening DTs seems like a cool idea. Yeah, um, actually, I'm about to start working on an infill plane. Um, and uh, doing dovetail um, joinery on that. Um, I actually have, um, I had a video a while ago, I was making, uh, oh, the, um, my panel gauge. Um, I needed a, the thumb screw goes down and I didn't want to put a washer underneath and I didn't want the thumb screw to dig into the beam. And so in this, I put in a, a brass um, slot in here. And so the thumb screw hits that brass as it comes down. Uh, the problem was I couldn't find square stock that was the right size. Um, so I found round stock. And so I put the round stock down there and I took a plane and actually planed it down flat. Um, so yes, you can actually plane brass. Um, and I've done um, aluminum as well, um, where I can, you can plane aluminum as well. Uh, it's kind of fun to to do because it's it's softer considerably and actually works really well. But yeah, it sounds like you're having fun with that. Looking forward to seeing what you get. If you guys haven't seen Worth the Effort where's worth blah, 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 Worth the Efforts channel, um, definitely go look at it. He is actually one of the big reasons why I am uh, doing hand tools today. So he has he's got a really, really good channel. Lots it's of great information. Fault. I really need to have no We got enough time for one more? Oh, okay. I'm going to do a combo of a couple of questions about cold. Would excessive cold do anything to PVA glue and best wax or lubricant for cold weather plane use? Um, yes. Well, if, if PVA freezes, um, it can cause issues. Um, you can get away with a single light freeze, um, but most of the time after a second freeze, you, it, it's trash. Um, so don't let it freeze. You can take it down close to the freezing point and not have any problem with it. But if it freezes, the, the crystal structure in there can break up the, the glue. Um, so yeah, um, don't, don't let it freeze. But down to that, you're fine. Um, cold weather, weather plain lubrication. You know, most oils and waxes uh, work just as well down near freezing as they do any other temperature. Um, so I don't really change anything from that. Though being in a what's usually an air conditioned basement is fine, but now it's a little chillier than normal. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just normally use my, my paste wax or three in one oil and uh, I'd use that pretty much at any temperature. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, let's wrap that up. So I'm not sure what we're doing next week. Um, I haven't quite gotten my head around catching up yet so we'll have that information out but if you have any ideas or anything you'd like me to do for a live video let me know and i think that'll do it for now so uh until next time have a wonderful day bye, bye.